Hi friends, my name is Nilesh. In this video, we are going to continue the 15 factor apps. In the earlier videos, we covered four of the factors from the 15 factors. In part one, we looked at code base and dependencies. And in part two, we looked at the config and the backing services. In this third series or third part of this 15 factor app series, we are going to see the next two factors, which is build, release and run, which talks about strictly separating the build and run stages. And we also look at processes, which talks about executing the application as one or more standalone processes. So let's get started with the first one, which is the build, release and run stage. If you look at a typical software design lifecycle, uh, we go through these various stages, which is like designing the application, then writing the code for that application, building the application code to uh, an artifact and then releasing that application. And as part of this release, we also combine this with the configuration for each specific environment. When we combine the build and the configuration, the release is uh, categorized and then we deploy that application code or the release artifact to the target environment, which, uh, which forms the part of our uh, run phase. So uh, why do we need to separate these uh, phases? Uh, let's start by looking at each one of them. Let's try to understand what goes in each of the phase. Uh, design is typically about creating the logical design of the application. Like what are the components which go into the application? What are the domain services that are required? What different uh, microservices we want to have for the application? So this doesn't have anything to do with actually writing the code, but to create that logical uh, representation of how the code will look like or to identify the major components of the code. In the cloud native environment, this would be identifying your domain and then creating the set of microservices around those domains. Next stage is the code stage. This is where we identify uh, what programming languages we'll be using uh, what frameworks will be using what databases will be using so it could be something like identifying whether we need to build a front-end application using maybe modern day tech stacks like or javascript frameworks like react or react native or angular or Vue. it could be thing like identifying whether we want to build this application as a batch process or real-time processing application uh, whether we want to use uh, some analytics so the things related to the programming side of the uh, code and it also goes into identifying what frameworks we'll be using. So let's say if you are using Java as a programming language, do we want to use something like a Spring Boot, which provides a very opinionated, opinionated framework for building Java applications? Uh, it could be like if you are building .NET, then using the enterprise application patterns for .NET as a library, things like that. So identifying the actual uh, building blocks of the code. Once the code is ready, the next stage is to build. Now, uh, historically, or uh, when I started my career, building the application was done using the uh, developer's laptop itself, and then files were copied over. Times have changed over the last couple of decades, and. Uh, now almost everybody follows the continuous integration and continuous deployment or continuous delivery CI CD pipelines to build the code and to deploy the artifact. So I assume that since we are talking about cloud native applications, you already have a CI CD process in place and build typically forms the part of continuous integration where the code is independently built on a dedicated server or a machine which is independent of the developer's workstation where the code is uh, really uh, uh, written. So developer anyway, he has the uh, responsibility to make sure the code builds locally. But once he checks in the code, there is this continuous integration server which pulls the latest version of the code and it looks at all the dependencies and it independently builds that code to make sure that whatever works on the developer machine can uh, be deployed to a target environment and it still works the way it is expected. So as part of the continuous integration, uh, the CI server also does additional steps. In most likelihood, you will have the automated code scanning happening using a tool like uh, SonarCube or any other tool which 
uh, gives you a code quality. You might be running automated unit test. You might be running the automated uh, integration test. If you are following a DevSecOps uh, principles and you have your pipelines integrated with DevSecOps tool, then you might also be doing things like the code scanning. It could be a static code scan uh, using many of the available tools. Once the code passes through all of these uh, gates, then you build the artifact and that artifact is pushed to an artifact repository like uh, Nexus, for example. Uh, and then this forms the immutable artifact. Every build can be deployed to a target environment and that uh, build output is what is uh, the output of the build. So uh, we have the immutable build and that uh, the relationship between a build and the deployment can be one to many, which means that the same build which is generated at the end of the continuous integration cycle can be deployed to, uh, let's say, a development environment, uh, uh, SIT or integration test environment, pre-production and production. So we have one to many relationship between a build and a deployment. Now, why do we need to separate uh, the build and the release phase? Uh, the whole purpose of separating this is it makes it easier for us to keep track. It gives us the audit capability and it also gives the, us the ability to roll back. So uh, as we discussed in the earlier uh, part two of this series about external configuration, we talked about storing the configuration for the application external to the code. And by doing that, we generate the build output as part of the build step. And then we merge that with the environment configuration. This is where the release happens. So release process involves taking the artifact from artifact repository taking the configuration from uh, external configuration source. If you are talking about Microsoft Azure, it could be a, a thing like Azure Key Vault, which allows us to store the credentials and secrets uh, external to the application. You could also use thing like HashiCorp Vault to store the configurations and secrets and sensitive information uh, outside of the application. And once we combine that, those two, we release, we create a release and that release gets deployed to the target environment. That forms the run stage. And typically the run stage is which, uh, which involves the cloud provider. In most cases, uh, you might have a private cloud or you might be using public cloud services. And nowadays, most of the applications are using uh, containerized technologies like Docker containers and Kubernetes to deploy the application. So it makes it easier for the applications to deploy to hybrid cloud scenarios or multi-cloud scenarios. So when it comes to the run stage, we use the services provided by cloud provider in terms of using things like scalability to use auto scaling capabilities provided by the cloud. It could be high availability where we deploy the application to multiple uh, zones, availability zones or uh, multiple regions. It could also mean that we enable disaster recovery where we have things running in active active mode or active passive mode. Uh, we also use the observability features provided by the cloud, uh, which means that we could use things like the Azure monitor or uh, the logs capabilities provided by uh, the cloud provider. And instead of using the cloud provider, we could also use things like uh, open source tools. We could use uh, Prometheus, Grafana, these kind of tools in the run stage where the application is running in the target environment and to enhance things around uh, monitoring, observability, resiliency, and so on and so forth. So these phases, the build, release, run, and even design uh, when it comes to the 15-factor apps. Uh, in the 15-factor apps, design is added as part of build, release, and run. So 12-factor apps talks about build, release, and run. We also have the design component in the 15 factor apps. So this helps us to make sure that we have a clear separation in terms of how the code is designed, how it is built, how it gets released and how it runs in the target environment. Let's go into the next one, which is uh, stateless processes or processes as it is called in the 12 factor app. Uh, this states that we should try to run the application as a stateless process. But what does exactly mean by stateless process? If we look at most of the application, we have some or the other form of state. We have stateful applications, 
uh, almost 90% of the application that we built are stateful. So why do we say that we should have a stateless process? What is stateless process means is we should try not to have the state in the memory of the process or the application which runs, it should not try to store the state of the application as part of the process. Why is that? If we look at the earlier implementations of, uh, let's say, web servers, IIS, for example, we used to have things like the session state or the application state, which allowed us to store information for a particular user session or for a particular application on the IIS servers. Now, imagine that you have to scale the application. If the state is part of the process, if it resides in the memory of the process, then it becomes difficult to scale. The way we can scale is vertical scaling. We cannot scale horizontally in this case. Uh, we In this scenario where we have to scale horizontally, then we have to externalize the state. And nowadays, most of the modern application languages and the frameworks, they support that we externalize the state. We talked about this as a backing service in our last uh, video. So the recommendation here is anything that is long lasting state must be external to the application and it must be provided using backing service. So the common example of uh, externalized state is a caching service. And uh, uh, you can say that Redis, for example, is a good use case where we can externalize the caching that is required for an application into an external uh, database or data store and that can be treated as a backing service when it comes to the 15 factor app. This also allows us to make the processes scalable. Processes can come and go and since the state is externalized, we won't lose the information if a particular process crashes or we have to restart the process. Here I've shown the diagram of one of the example which I use for my other demos. In this demo, I'm using a producer to produce a certain number of messages, let's say 1000 messages, and those messages are stored onto a RabbitMQ. And then we have a set of consumers or consumer process which consumes those messages in a batch. Now, if I want to scale the consumer or the producer, I can scale them independently because the state is externalized into the RabbitMQ. Same way, if the consumer, let's say in this case, I've got five consumers running, something happens to one of these consumers, this doesn't impact the other four consumers and they can continue to do their work while I can restart the impacted consumer. So this allows me to scale my applications independently of the state and by sharing or by removing the state from the application process, it makes my application highly scalable and also resilient. So uh, here we can use the share nothing pattern, which states that we externalize the state and different applications, they decouple each other by using things like messaging or some other way of externalizing the state. If you want to have a look at the details of this application or the demo that I talked about, it's available on my GitHub repo and I provided the link here. Uh, I would also like to give some references about the things that I talked in this uh, video. So uh, most of the things that I talked about for the 15 factor apps, I referenced the Beyond 12 factor app uh, book from O'Reilly or it's a report written by Kevin Hoffman. There is also a GitHub repo created by Christopher Jude on the 15 factor apps workshop and it goes into the details of each of those uh, uh, factors and there is also a github repo by a gentleman named Vikas Gupta uh, which is also about the 15 factor apps so you can refer to this book as well as these repositories uh, github repositories to understand more about 15 factor apps if you want to go through the remaining factors while I cover them in the subsequent videos so a quick summary of what we did uh, so far uh, we have covered six of the factors in the three videos uh, the first one covered uh, the code base and dependencies. In the second video, we covered the config and backing services. And this video was about the separation of build, release and run stage and also about stateless processes. So with that, uh, we come to the end of this video. I hope you found it useful. If you find this video useful, please hit the like button. That's what encourages me to do what I do and what I love to do as well. Uh, also subscribe to the channel 
for the uh, future videos. Thank you. Until next time, code with passion and strive for excellence.